Speaker, I have never ever presented with slides or in six minutes and 20 seconds. I'm gonna try my best. <laughs> okay. This is the first sandwich that changed my life. I was born into what I call a fat-free, low-fat, no-fat, sugar-free household. I didn't taste a peanut butter and jelly sandwich when I was about eight years old. As hard as I tried to get people to share their sandwiches with me in school, nobody wanted my smash fat-free turkey with Miracle Whip. I did not know that grilled cheese had melted cheese until I was well into my teenage years. Imagine my surprise. Growing up, the daughter of a father with a severe eating disorder meant that food was never that happy of a meal in my house. We couldn't go out to restaurants unless we found out that the chairs didn't have arms on them. This man weighs as much as my father did until I was 13 years old. I discovered adversity when I was very young, walking down the street with my dad when people would laugh at us. My first claiming mistake of my own food sovereignty happened when I was about 14 in my 10th grade marine biology class when John Robbins was narrating a documentary called Diet for a New America that I watched and I went home and proclaimed my vegetarianism after eating the last piece of meat in my life, a slice of butterball turkey. <laughs> that day my father threatened to sue the school district. <laughs> Ironically, my parents were much less concerned when I started a new path of weight loss, my second claim of food sovereignty, where over the course of a year in my life, I subsisted almost entirely on fat-free yogurt and fat-free jelly beans, won a modeling contest, walked the guest runway, and lost my period for six months because I was so anorexic. I'm very blessed that my parents uh, intervened at a certain point. When I was 19 and my third claim towards food sovereignty, I became a vegan after reading The Food Revolution by John Robbins. At that moment in my life, I think is when I actually realized that it was not just about the food I was eating, but me having an understanding of what I was eating and how it affected everything around me, including the animals that I cared so much about. At this time, I was a student at UC Santa Barbara. Who knew at the time that there was this funky little food co-op in Isla Vista? I didn't know I was shopping at Albertsons. No one ever talked to me about organic food before. When I finally found the co-op and walked in, people like that guy were working there, and I didn't wear patchwork, and I didn't smell like patchouli, and I didn't have dreadlocks, so nobody was nice to me. <laughs> but luckily for me, that guy worked there. That's Casey. I went to the co-op one day just on a whim, and he was behind the register, and oh my, did I get a crush on this boy? <laughs> Because of him, actually, the reason I started shopping at the Isla Vista Food Co-op, um, and he and I are actually still really good friends, and he loves to hear the story about how he was the reason that I became invested with the co-op. After coming back from studying abroad in Australia, I was really excited to see Casey and get my mock chicken salad, and my roommates were like, but didn't you hear the co-op is closed? It burned down while you were gone. And I was like, what are you talking about? Due to fire, the co-op was actually closed for three months and almost went out of business, mostly because when inspectors came in to reopen the store, they found the illegal shed, the illegal produce cooler, and the asbestos. Speaking of fires, the burning of the Bank of America in February of 1970 is actually what ignited a revolution in Isla Vista to take back our community. And the food co-op was just one of many organizations that were birthed out of this moment of revolutionary activism. I feel really blessed that a community decided to take control back over their food in particular, and a bunch of people got together and started buying their food all together in a club, and at the height of the buyer's club, over a thousand people were gathering in the parking lot behind the old credit union to get their food from local farmers and local producers. And it was a bunch of students, in particular one student activist, that got school credit for actually opening a storefront food co-op because they wanted to ensure the longevity of people having access to food like this in the college town of Isla Vista. It's amazing what can happen when a thoughtful group of committed hippies can create <laughs> change in a community. Um, and that was 40 years ago, and the co-op still is going very strongly. Um, and we definitely are still serving our community in the best way possible. Um, and so what a co-op actually is, is a business that is owned and controlled and used by all the same people that um, are part of the organization. A place like Chaucer's is owned and controlled by either a family or individual with partners, and it's used by the general public. A place like Whole Foods is owned by stockholders and controlled by a board and used by the general public. And a place like the co-op is owned and controlled by all of us and used by us also. Our original structure was this spiral. Um, <laughs> you, had to, you had to pay to use the co-op in order to shop there. In order to shop there, you had to work there. There was no markup. Nobody was really very trained, and nothing was accounted for, like if it was dropped or stolen or spoiled, it didn't work that well. Um, this is the second sandwich that changed my life, because this is the first job that I ever had as a food co-op. I was a sandwich maker, and when I got to the co-op and got this job, I started to realize that maybe this is what I wanted to do. Not make sandwiches, but get sandwiches like this out into the hands of as many people as possible, so that people could have access to local and organic food. So the question was, how are we gonna get the co-op to not just serve those kinds of people, 
but to also answer those kinds of people. Because that's really who makes up the most of Isla Vista. And so that became the mission of what I was trying to do for the food co-op. How do we get everybody to be a part of our amazing store? <laughs> and this is very legitimate. <laughs> so we hired her, that's Jamie. Jamie was the first person that we ever hired that wore full face makeup. It was amazing. <laughs> Within a month of her working at the store, I got her to stop wearing makeup and all of her acne cleared up. It was awesome. <laughs> um, and so really, Jamie is the person that I credit the most with transitioning our store to serving everybody in the community. Um, this is an example of some of the amazing things that we can now do because the co-op is so open to so many different people. We do tampon education for women at festivals in Isla Vista. We do grill marketing where we dress up in funny clothes and hand out free bags of stuff to students. We have our country fair. We had the first live broadcasted vegetarian hot dog eating contest on KCSB last year. <laughs> but the greatest thing that ever happened for us was the day that the County of Santa Barbara Redevelopment Agency gave us a grant of $40,000 and the member owners that believed in us lent us $70,000 so we could turn that into that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is the Iowa Sister Co-op that I am so happy to be the general manager of and we've turned the sales around and we now offer things better than ever before. Right now at the co-op, there's a last Thursday artist showcase happening as we speak. We are the only store that has identified all non-GMO products and verified um, more local produce being purchased from more local farmers than ever before. And the most important thing to me is that that sandwich has now gotten into the hands of so many people all over this community. Over 100 people a day are eating those sandwiches. Um, that's me, I'm the GM now. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.